Good afternoon, everyone. This is Kenzie Pulsifer from the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction. Welcome to our August Friday Forum. We're very happy to have with us today Dr. Keith Porter. Dr. Porter is a research professor at the University of Colorado Boulder and principal of the consulting company SPA Risk, LLC. He has 30 years experience in professional practice and university research related to natural disasters. Dr. Porter leads a study called Natural Hazards Mitigation Saves, estimating benefit cost ratios of code adoption above code design, private and public buildings to reduce losses in earthquakes, hurricanes, floods, and fires in the wildland urban interface. He led the engineering aspects of the shakeout, arc storm, and haywire disaster, pl disaster planning scenarios for the US Geological Survey. He is also a licensed California professional engineer and holds engineering degrees from UC Davis, UC Berkeley, and Stanford University. Just before we get started, I would like to let everyone know that you can ask questions at any time during the presentation uh, just by typing them into the Q&A box on your screen, and we'll save all of the questions till the end of the presentation. And with that, I will pass it over to Dr. Porter. Thanks, Kenzie. Um... I'm going to be telling you about uh, natural hazard mitigation, and you've probably heard about it before, but I want to make the case for mitigation uh, in terms of lower societal total cost of ownership of, uh, of, of, of buildings in our countries. Um, now, the United States has, in recent years, been using $100 billion per year to natural disasters. That's only the tangible readily calculated uh, monetary losses. There are other intangible losses and uh, losses that aren't uh, included in those hundred, that $100 billion figure. And the reason is that most Americans are subject to natural hazards on an ongoing basis. Here you're seeing four maps showing an, um, an estimate of the number of uh, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, residents who are subject to flood, earthquake, hurricane, and wildfire. And many of those people are subject to multiple perils. So in the middle, you're seeing a Venn diagram that says, you know, of the 85 million people who are subject to earthquakes, 26% of the U.S. population, uh, 25 million uh, of them are subject to earthquake and fire, the wildland urban interface. That's that sort of intersection there in the uh, left-hand blue uh, bubble. And uh, similarly, you can see that uh, there are uh, tens of millions of Americans subject to multiple uh, natural hazards. Now, because of that, uh, those ongoing losses, um, the, the United States government provides disaster mitigation funds to try to reduce the losses. Now, in the late 1990s, FEMA estimated that its mitigation grants, mostly to retrofit public sector buildings, we're saving society $4 in avoided future losses per uh, tax dollar spent. But in 1999, the U.S. Congress, suspicious of the claim and desiring to cut spending, demanded that FEMA commission an independent study of that benefit cost analysis. What you're seeing here is the, uh, the cover of the publication uh, produced because of that mandate uh, in, 19, in 2005. And this study, uh, in which I participated uh, along with many, many other people, uh, found that money spent on reducing the risk of natural hazards is a sound investment, and on average, a dollar spent by FEMA on natural hazard mitigation provides the benefit to the nation about $4 in future benefit. We came up with exactly the same number that FEMA had been telling Congress it was uh, saving the, the uh, uh, American people. Now, that was a very useful study. Uh, but it was limited to mostly uh, retrofit of existing public sector buildings. The four to one figure um, became widely quoted as applying basically to everything. Uh, all natural hazard mitigation saves four dollars per dollar spent, even though we knew that was that was not the case. So the study uh, was valuable, but uh, a number of questions remained to be answered. What about all the billions of dollars that? the private sector had been spending on uh, retrofit or could spend in the future to retrofit existing private sector buildings. What would be the cost effectiveness of uh, exceeding our current building codes and improving them to make buildings stronger, stiffer, more resistant to flood, more resistant to hurricanes, so on. And for that matter, what was the cost effectiveness of the last 
uh, generation of code development. What was the cost effectiveness of retrofitting or otherwise improving utilities and transportation infrastructure? And what about other perils that we had not examined in the 2005 study, especially fire at the wildland urban interface? So beginning in 2016, uh, FEMA and the other sponsors you're seeing listed on the right-hand side of the screen uh, provided the funding to uh, update the 2005 study and address uh, these questions. 18 months later, this 18 months after the publication of the first edition of this update. Uh, it's already been cited 250 times in the popular press, quoted in congressional testimony, um, and it has influenced the, the Federal Emergency Management Agency's natu National Mitigation Investment Strategy, which was released last week. Now, on the left-hand side, you're seeing some of the statistics of this study. It was truly enormous. $2 million spent so far, seven sponsors, three government, four private sector, uh, more than a dozen authors, more than 100 participants, 70 organizations across the uh, building trades, uh, 20 peer reviewers, 800 peer reviewed comments, uh, a gigantic 500 page, now 600 page report, and a smaller uh, set of two page fact sheets to make the whole thing a whole lot more uh, accessible. Um, Canada faces many of the same problems that the United States faces, some of them worse than the United States, for example, because of uh, the inaccessibility of Canadian flood maps. You're seeing here a couple of quotes uh, from Canadians who find the, um, uh, the, the flood maps uh, uh, inaccessible, hard to understand, uh, and, and old. So Canada has uh, a lot of the same problems as the United States, some of them uh, worse. Okay, so let's talk about the kinds of mitigation measures that we uh, examined, that we quantified in this benefit-cost analysis. And by the way, if the term doesn't mean anything to you, benefit-cost analysis is an attempt to estimate a, a ratio of the benefits of something divided by its cost. So whenever you see a benefit-cost ratio that's greater than one, that means that the benefits exceed the costs, and it's that, that measures cost effective. So this, this big study, all it tried to do is calculate benefit cost ratios for a lot of different mitigation options. So here are some of the options that one can do to build new. So these are some of the options that one can uh, use to build buildings to better resist flood. Um, uh, 30 years ago or so, uh, U.S. buildings were built so that uh, their first floor was just at the level of what we call the base flood elevation. That is to say, the level of uh, above ground where there's a 1% chance of uh, wa the water being that high or greater in, in every year. Um, 30 years later, we now build most of our buildings so that their first floor is one foot higher at a relatively small marginal cost of additional construction. And of course, nothing prevents one from building even higher than one foot above the base flood elevation. So we thought about what the costs and benefits would be of uh, building higher above the floodplain. Uh, one can also retrofit existing buildings to better resist uh, flooding. We can uh, acquire those properties and uh, uh, and, and tear them down and use that space for parks or whatnot. One can take those buildings and uh, raise their elevation, as you're seeing in the, uh, the upper two photographs. Um, you can wet floodproof the basements, that is to say, remove all the damageable, the mostly damageable stuff in the basement and make it so that uh, when water does come into the basement, it doesn't cost so much uh, in repairs. And one can relocate furnaces and water heaters from basements and crawl spaces so that they are higher above the, uh, the floodplain. This is the result of our estimate of um, the benefit cost ratio for uh, the last 30 years of uh, co-development to better resist flooding. That is to say, this is the cost effectiveness of building our houses and other buildings one foot above base flood elevation. It saves six dollars for every dollar spent um, for every year of construction in the United States. Uh, we spend about 90 million dollars more per year than we would have done 30 years ago. 
but we save uh, $550 million. And you can see that most of that savings comes from avoided property losses, uh, but there are savings also from avoided additional living expenses and direct business interruption. There's some savings from indirect business interruption, and by that uh, I mean the, uh, 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 the, the savings that I experience if you uh, don't uh, suffer from a flood because I do business with you. Uh, I buy you, I buy from you or I sell from you. And if you continue in business because of the, uh, because of your mitigation, uh, I enjoy some savings and part of the, uh, insurance premium that, uh, you would pay to, uh, uh, deal with flooding. Uh, part of that, the overhead and profit would be, um, would actually be savings. If you, if the, uh, premiums were priced according in, in proportion to the, 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 the peer premium, the risk, so that everything in the premium above the peer premium uh, would go down as the risk goes down. So the overhead and profit would go down. That would be savings to uh, me as the insured. Uh, we found that above code flood design is also cost effective. So if we were to build our new houses not one foot above the floodplain, but five feet above the floodplain, uh, it would cost an additional about billion dollars a year for every year of new construction in the United States, but it would avoid uh, more than four billion dollars in future losses. Uh, and you're seeing the proportions here from property losses, additional living expenses, indirect business interruption, insurance, and casualties and post-traumatic post-traumatic uh, stress disorder. Now it's noteworthy, I think, that um, the, that this mitigation measure above code flood design is cost effective when you just consider the property savings alone. So just the owner um, is saving 1.5, uh, uh, about a dollar and a half for every dollar of additional construction costs. Um, now, all of that information that I just told you about um, uh, flood mitigation and benefit cost ratios for flooding ignore climate change. Um, climate change only aggravates the problem. What you're seeing here is an estimate by uh, some um, uh, 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 climate scientists um, in a publication called uh, Natural Hazard Earth System Science uh, that projects out into the future, uh, future uh, flood losses in the United States in billions of dollars if we follow either of two representative concentration pathways, RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5. That's a technical term of art from, um, uh, uh, from the IPCC that says, you know, we have choices about how we're going to deal with climate change. We can either act aggressively, which would be RCP 4.5, or we can do nothing and continue to uh, increase um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, as we're doing now, and that would be RCP 8.5. So these, these, these increasing lines show future losses, and this, is, this has nothing to do, this, this, this ignores uh, population changes, uh, development, and flood control. So all of these things, climate change, population, development, flood control, also matter to the benefit cost ratios, and we have only considered um, uh, the, the current conditions. Uh, we also looked at options to build better or to retrofit for fire at the wildland urban interface. This is a problem that's common to the United States and Canada. And generally what one does is one clears defensible space around the building uh, for, of fuel, you know, you cut back uh, grass and shrubs and whatnot. Um, you use fire resistant materials in the roof and in the uh, exterior cladding, you enclose the foundation and you make sure that there's good access for the fire department to come and fight fires. That's, that's what you would have to do. Um, the United States has a model building code called the International Wildland Urban Interface Code that very few communities actually adopt that would basically require those measures in places where it is, uh, uh, you know, that it's in the wildland urban interface. This map is showing the places where it would be cost effective to do so and the benefit cost ratio. Now, the map is shaded by U.S. County, um, but that's not to say that it's cost effective to do this uh, 
everywhere in the county. This is just, the, it's shaded by the, the place within the county that has the most cost effective, um, uh, it, where it's most cost effective to adopt the International Wildland Urban Interface Code. Doing so, where it is cost effective, would save $4 for every dollar of additional construction cost. An, an annual benefit of $3 billion uh, per, that is to say, per year of new construction at an annual cost of $800 million. That is to say, we would spend $800 million more per year if every place where it's cost effective to adopt the International Wildland Urban Interface Code uh, actually did so. And you're seeing that most of those Benefits come from property losses, but there's also insurance overhead and profit um, savings and additional living expenses and uh, indirect business interruption, casualties, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, Canada uh, also has a, um, a problem with fire at the wildland urban interface. Its fire hazard is about half that of the United States. Um, this uh, uh, comes out of a study performed that uh, we performed for the uh, National Research Council of Canada um, on the cost effectiveness of adopting wildland urban interface codes in Canada. And we found that um, it is, despite the fact that the hazard is a bit lower in Canada, it would still be cost effective throughout much of Canada to adopt the wildland urban interface code. You would spend less in the long run on buildings uh, that are in the wildland urban interface if you spent a little bit more upfront uh, because of the savings downstream, the avoided future losses would make those buildings less costly in the long, long run to own. So here are the overall benefit cost ratios. In the, you're seeing five columns to the right side of this chart. Those are for the five general approaches to natural hazard mitigation that we looked at. Uh, adopting code, that is to say the last 30 years of code development in the United States, uh, designing to exceed the current code requirements, uh, retrofitting mostly private sector buildings, lifeline retrofits, and uh, uh, a review of the federal grants that the U.S. federal government has made over the last uh, two and a half decades. Uh, the top row is showing you the overall benefit cost ratio for that uh, mitigation approach. The next row is showing you the cost in billions. Some of them are in billions of dollars per year of new construction, and some of them our totals, uh, and the benefits uh, in billions of dollars, sometimes per year and sometimes total. And then down below, you're seeing the uh, benefit cost ratios for some combination of a mitigation measure and uh, apparel. So the six to one number in the upper left of the blue, uh, the blue bar says that um, adopting code to better resist rivering flood, that is to say, building our, all our buildings a foot above base flood elevation, saves six dollars for every dollar. Uh, spent. Um, now I've had to block out uh, the middle column because the uh, sponsor has not yet uh, released it. They want to have a big splashy release event, uh, so I'm, I'm hiding the um, information about building retrofit. But I'm showing you uh, one number that uh, I don't think they'll mind my showing you, and that is 520 billion dollars. That would be the cost to do each of 15 private sector uh, building retrofits. Uh, where it is cost effective to do so. That's $520 billion that one can uh, could spend cost effectively to uh, resist uh, 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 damage to existing buildings. Um, the Pew Centers for the Charitable Trust have recently been framing the problem of mitigation investment in terms of a gap, a mitigation investment gap. And that refers to the difference between what we're spending and the amount that we're spending that would actually minimize the societal total cost of ownership. Um, so what this says is we could spend a half a trillion dollars in the United States this year and doing so would eliminate, would, would cost effectively eliminate uh, the, the risk from uh, a number of different uh, uh, perils and, uh, and damage conditions. Um, let me tell you a little bit more, take a sort of a darker take on one of these, uh, on one of these benefit cost ratios. Consider the above code uh, option. Uh, it says $4 saved for every dollar spent. Um, now we're not building above code. Uh, we're building to code for the most part. Very few 
uh, developers build to exceed code. Um, and you could look at that uh, four to one number. Uh, it it's corresponds to $4 billion per year of additional cost and $16 billion a year of uh, potential benefits. As saying, in, in a darker way, you could say that developers are currently saving $4 billion a year by not having an optimal code, by not having a code that requires buildings to be uh, least total societal cost of ownership. And to the, and the rest of society is subsidizing those savings to the, uh, the development industry. Uh, the rest of society is losing $16 billion a year uh, to uh, provide that $4 billion a year of savings uh, to, uh, to developers. Um, the U.S. National Treasury um, is currently saving about $800 million a year in lower outlays and $125 million a year in, uh, in receiving greater tax revenues thanks to some of the mitigation measures uh, that I've talked about here, the, the, uh, the federal grants. Uh, the total benefit is about $920 million to the, to the uh, federal treasury. And you can see that the breakout from um, uh, of where that $920 million uh, comes from. Uh, in this study, we brought a new, uh, we broke down the numbers in a new way. We wanted to ask the question, uh, if we do natural hazard mitigation, who wins and who loses? Because you know, society is not a monolithic entity with a single pocket and a single wad of cash. Uh, we thought perhaps um, uh, different stakeholders would uh, benefit differently and some would win and some would lose. But what we found was that everybody wins. Uh, everyone enjoys the net benefits of uh, code development, which you're seeing on the left. Um, those are billions of dollars a year, that is billions of dollars per year of new construction. Um, and the different colors correspond to uh, different perils, and the different groups of bars correspond to uh, different stakeholder groups. So we looked at lenders, communities, tenants, title holders, that is to say just owners, and developers, and they, they all enjoy net benefits to varying degrees. The bar chart on the right uh, gives uh, similar numbers for designing to exceed the current uh, code requirements. And these are uh, billions of dollars uh, for every year of uh, new construction that is designed to some sort of optimal level. Now, I have to qualify that everyone wins. Everyone wins sort of. Remember, the, the I showed you a pie chart, a few pie charts. Uh, this is the pie chart for optimal above code seismic design. Um, and you can see that the, um, uh, the benefits accrue to different stakeholders. Uh, the, the developer, the owner, and the tenants, and the, the lender uh, all receive benefits uh, in terms of reduced uh, property losses. Uh, the tenant enjoys re reductions in future additional living expenses uh, and direct business interruption, uh, deaths and injury, and so on. Um, and the owner and the tenant, but the owner and the tenant are the only ones who pay for uh, this optimal above code uh, seismic design. Now, because the the costs and the benefits are shared unequally, not everyone enjoys the same benefit cost ratio. From the developer's perspective, from the lender's perspective, from the community's perspective, they're all enjoying benefits when the owner designs or builds above code at no cost to themselves. So the benefit cost ratio is effectively infinite. The tenant enjoys a benefit cost ratio of 4.4 uh, because they're, uh, they're enjoying those benefits in terms of life safety and whatnot. And the owner in, enjoys a benefit cost ratio of just 1.4. So it's, it's still cost effective for the owner to uh, build a new, building, a, a new building in earthquake country to uh, better resist earthquakes, but not as much as uh, the tenants or the rest of society. And yet it's the owner that... Uh, has to bear all the costs of, or half the costs anyway, of um, above code design. We're assuming that the owner passes on half those costs uh, to the tenant. What if we could reallocate some of those costs from the owner to the, the other people who enjoy what we call co-benefits? Uh, the developer, the lender, uh, the community. So the, 
the um, the lender might uh, share some of the cost from the owner uh, by with a um, uh, a mortgage uh, rebate uh, that is uh, sized so that the lender and the owner so that you know the lender bears some of the costs the owner bears a little bit less cost so his uh, benefit cost ratio uh, goes down the lender's benefit cost ratio I'm sorry the owner's benefit cost ratio goes up because the cost is going down that's the denominator in this ratio you reduce the denominator and the, the ratio goes up uh, the lender's benefit cost ratio goes down from infinity to uh, the the same number that the owners enjoy. As a matter of fact, we can do this across the board. We can have uh, the local, the state, and the federal government give tax rebates uh, tuned so that the community is enjoying the same benefit cost ratio as the owner. This is a situation where everybody's interests are made to align. The total benefit cost ratio doesn't change. It was always 3.6 because we haven't changed any of the benefits and we haven't changed any of the costs. We've just moved the costs from one pocket to another. We've moved the costs from the owner to the developer, the lender, the tenant, and the community, at least to, to some extent. So everybody's interests are now aligned. Uh, everybody enjoys the same benefit cost ratio. The pie chart doesn't change, but the pie, in a sense, gets bigger. More people would do mitigation if the cost that they experienced was uh, less um, and that, that that would benefit everyone. So this brings us, this gives us a situation where we have a uh, fair distribution of costs and benefits and the interests of these different uh, stakeholder groups are all aligned. Whereas when uh, several of them paid nothing the inter and the owner paid uh, half of the cost, uh, the interests of society were not that well aligned. So how would we go about doing that? How would we go about sharing some of the co-benefits back from the uh, developer and the lender and so on uh, to, the, um, uh, uh, to the owner, the people who have to uh, bear the upfront cost? Uh, as I've said, several stakeholders enjoy co-benefits at, new, at uh, no cost. We recognize that. And the National Institute of Building Sciences has produced a white paper to say, okay, this is generally how this incentivization program might work. Um, we can lower interest rates to align the lender and the borrower about the cost ratio. We can lower property income taxes. We can lower insurance premiums and so on. This is generally how the math would work. So we are beginning to develop a package of uh, financial instruments or conceptual mitigation incentives to, uh, um, to align all those interests in, in that way. Um, now, I've talked about benefit cost ratios and great depth about benefits and costs, who pays them and, and who enjoys them. But benefit cost ratios are not the whole picture of mitigation investment decisions. Uh, the benefit cost ratios help inform those decisions. And, you know, this conceptual reallocation of cost could also help uh, people to decide, I'm going to go ahead and do mitigation. But mitigation decisions take place in a much broader context that we're not touching here. There are intangibles that we haven't quantified, things like um, a memorabilia and the safety of our pets and whatnot. These are intangibles that would add to the benefits and increase the benefit cost ratios. Furthermore, not everybody thinks of investments in terms of benefit cost ratios. Most people think of natural disasters in terms of the big one, you know, what, what happens in, it, in the worst case scenario. So these decisions, decisions to do mitigation investment are often driven by catastrophes that, you know, the, the, the catastrophes are sort of integrated into these benefit cost ratios, but they sort of disappear within the, uh, all the fancy math, and, and you don't get to see what happens in the big one in any of these benefit cost ratios. People make their decisions based on their recent experience with a natural disaster, with their risk aversion, they, 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 they consult their risk aversion, uh, they have other local priorities, guns, public health, etc. Uh, and um, public policymakers listen more to the people who talk louder. Uh, there are different uh, different segments of uh, of society have more power or less power to influence these decisions. There are also financial limitations. Not every community can afford to even make these decisions. They have limited bandwidth, knowledge, and um, and training. All these things affect 
mitigation decision, so I'm not offering benefit cost ratios as the final solution to uh, uh, natural hazard mitigation. You must do mitigation wherever the benefit cost ratio is greater than one and so on. But I am saying that these that this information can be used in a much broader context to inform uh, natural hazard mitigation decisions. So in summary, I've told you about this study entitled Natural Hazard Mitigation Saves. Um, that uh, came out in 2005, and then we have updated in 2018, being, uh, in October of 2018, and then again in January of 2019, and we'll have a new edition coming out in the next couple of months. And what it has shown is that uh, the last 30 years of code development have increased cost of new construction, but it has saved society much more. Uh, benefit cost ratio of $11 saved per additional dollar spent because of improvements in the building code. Uh, we've identified above code design options that would save society $4 per dollar spent. Uh, we will soon be telling you the benefit cost ratio for private sector uh, retrofitting of existing buildings. Utility and transportation infrastructure saves $4 per dollar spent, at least among the, um, uh, the particular measures that we examined. Uh, we found that fire at the well then urban interface is a serious threat to U.S. construction and uh, adopting the uh, uh, the uh, wildland urban interface code would save four dollars per dollar spent. We found that everybody benefits from mitigation on average in the long run. Each of those five sectors, we can map where mitigation is most cost effective, uh, and we have found that the uh, the retrofit problem, the problem of existing buildings, uh, has an enormous mitigation investment gap: two point three trillion dollars uh, to close the gap of um, private sector buildings where uh, retrofit would be cost effective. Uh, so what can all of that is, has, is mostly with regard to mostly of interest to Americans, uh, to the United States. What can a Canadian insurer take away from all of that? Uh, well, a lot of the message is the same. Natural hazard mitigation still saves, still saves everyone. Uh, we found that better buildings are affordable. The same is true in the United States and Canada. Uh, better buildings cost a little bit more. Uh, but if you think that um, it's too costly to uh, build our buildings better, just wait till we get the bill for not building our buildings better. Not building better costs a whole lot more than uh, uh, the upfront investment of uh, better construction, for example, building higher out of the floodplain. Uh, we found that uh, because, you know, code development generally advances cost effectiveness of construction, those communities that lag in code cycles uh, or that weaken the provisions of building codes uh, are losing out. That is fiscally imprudent, it's short-sighted, and it will cost society in the long run. Um, we found that above code design has a lower life cycle cost when one considers all of society. Uh, we found that insurers, lenders, and governments could share their co-benefits, that is to say the benefits that they experience thanks to owner's investment, uh, back to the owners, reducing the total cost of owning a better building below that of code minimum. So it would actually cost less in the long run for an owner to build above code, uh, especially if the owner were given uh, assistance in that, in that expense by the people who are enjoying co-benefits. Um, the methods that uh, are employed here can be applied uh, in Canadian conditions, and we have done that to a very limited extent for uh, the National Research Council of Canada. Uh, ICLR and SPA risk are using a procedure called benefit transfer where uh, uh, to apply this the results of the study to Canada. Now, benefit transfer is a fancy economic term for something very simple that, that is to say, well, if the benefit cost ratio is four to one in the United States, then let's assume it's four to one in Canada. Uh, and how big is the cost in Canada? You multiply that by four and that gives you the, the benefit to Canada. It's, it's a little bit more fancy than that. We account for things like different hazard conditions and uh, different construction costs and whatnot. But uh, nonetheless, it's a way to take a very expensive multi-million dollar study in the United States and apply it uh, to Canadian conditions and come up with a reasonable estimate of the uh, cost effectiveness of natural hazard mitigation uh, in Canada. And with that, I will uh, conclude and take questions. And 
Kenzie, you want to come off mute and take questions? Oh, I'm so sorry. I had my, uh, <laughs> I thought it was off mute. Um, thank you, Keith, so much for your presentation. Um, we will go right into questions. I just want to remind everyone that if you do have questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A box right now. Um, so I'll start with the first one from Alex. It, the question is, has this sort of analysis been performed for net zero energy residential construction? We haven't performed it, and we didn't do any energy cost benefit analysis where that, that led me to do uh, the um, uh, literature search. Uh, so uh, that's a fancy way of saying I don't know. Okay. All right. Our next our next question is from Suzanne, and she asks, with such a strong focus on mitigation, is there a risk that prevention is forgotten? So many people will not be in a position to afford the cost for mitigation measures. Aren't we sending the wrong message if promotion of mitigation measures is not closely connected with downscaling of business as, us as of business as usual, which leads to high emission scenarios, et cetera? Uh, it, the point is valid. Um, there are other mitigation measures that are nowhere near as costly. Um, uh, business continuity planning and disaster recovery uh, is a very inexpensive approach to natural hazard mitigation. Um, and, you know, just making a plan and thinking through what are you going to do in case your uh, factory is flooded uh, can save you money in the long run. Now, we have, we're hoping to do that study. Uh, we think that there's a federal agency that's willing to support it. Uh, and when we get that support, we will uh, do the study and add uh, business continuity planning and disaster recovery. A number of the retrofit measures that we looked at here are actually very inexpensive. Uh, on the on the order of uh, ten twenty dollars and um, an hour or two of a homeowner's time, so not all of these mitigation measures are enormous and you know take thousands of hours and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Some of them are are, are very accessible and are uh, are promoted by uh, the Red Cross, all sorts of entities that are thinking of the uh, mitigation from. Uh, the perspective of, of, of people who don't have so, so much money. But I also want to point out that um, uh, just because we say uh, this is a, you know, these particular mitigation measures are, are cost effective does not imply that others are not. There's a fallacy, there's a logical fallacy called the not as bad as fallacy, uh, where you say, well, you know, um, uh, new buildings are really not as big of a problem as existing buildings, so uh, the con you know your conclusions about new buildings don't matter. Well, that's not that's not true. Both things there can be more than one big issue. There can be more than one thing that is cost effective, and the fact that we haven't talked about all of them should not be taken to mean that others that we haven't talked about are not cost effective. Okay, great. Uh, and the next question is from Ron. He asks, does your analysis consider the value or cost of land specific to lands potentially lost due to, a ha due to hazards which cannot be mitigated through structural means? Uh, well, some of the measures are um, uh, like buyouts. Some of them do uh, involve the purchase of a property and the land on it where you uh, buy the property, uh, you hand the owner the money, the, the, the owner buys a new piece of property uh, out of, say, the floodplain, and you turn that land into parkland or you know, some other use that, um, that, doesn't, uh, you know, that doesn't impose a, 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 as big a, a risk. Um, a lot of the measures are purely structural in nature, um, where the land value doesn't change. Uh, a lot of the measures are non-structural in nature, where again the land value uh, just doesn't enter into it; it doesn't change the um, uh, the costs or the benefits. Okay. And next is a question from Paul: What are the lowest hanging fruit in terms of lowest cost solutions that have the greatest effect that property owners can do to mitigate risk of fire, flood, wind? Is there a list somewhere? Yeah, the, I, I've, I've given you in 35 minutes the uh, summary um, 
a summary of information that appears in 600 pages. Uh, so the um, the best way to, to uh, find out about the low-hanging fruit is to look for the fact sheets. If you Google uh, mitigation saves and National Institute of Building Sciences, it will take you to a page where you can download the whole report for free, but you'll also see a bunch of fact sheets. These are like two-page documents that address one aspect of the study in non-technical language with easy-to-understand pictures. Um, and on the front of every one of those pages, you will see that overall summary table. So you'll see there are some mitigation, some combinations of mitigation measure and peril that have a benefit cost ratio of 11 to 1 and some have 3 to 1. Um, and so, you know, that's one take on the, uh, the most cost effective stuff. Uh, and then when you, you know, when you look around for, um, the, uh, the low cost mitigation measures like, uh, like, um, securing your space, you know, like, uh, bolting bookcases to the wall, uh, you'll see that, uh, there's a fact sheet just on that. Um, this is because bookcases fall over in earthquakes and hurt people. Uh, so you see a fact sheet on that and it talks about the cost and it talks about the benefit. Um, so, uh, I, I would say that, um, uh, I, I would, instead of answering the question, what I, I think of the low hanging fruit, I would say, take a look at the fact sheets, uh, look at the options that are most relevant to your decision situation. Uh, and, uh, you know, see what you, what works best for you in terms of your available resources and the benefit cost ratio. Okay, great. And I just have a couple of questions uh, here from Glenn uh, from ICLR. He asks you, he says, Keith, you have done benefit cost analysis for the U.S. Um, and for Canada. How did the two experiences compare? Sorry, I know you talked about it a little bit, but he asked, how did the two experiences compare and how are they different? Um, the, um, there, hmm. Uh, the, the, the one for Canada was uh, much less work. Uh, it's a much simpler study because it employs this benefit transfer method um, where it's just, it's basically borrowing the benefit cost ratios that we got from this great big $2 million study and then adjusting them up or down considering what we know about uh, Canadian construction and uh, uh, the, the hazards in, in Canada and generally what Canada is considering uh, doing. Um, so as a consequence, I would say the, um, uh, the Canadian benefit cost ratios, uh, are a little bit less certain. They're more easily attacked because we're using this, um, benefit transfer method rather than doing full blown benefit cost analysis that considers every, considers more of the details because there are details beyond what we looked at here that, that can matter, um, but with a small study, you just can't look at them all. So uh, the, uh, the, the, the numbers are probably right in the right uh, order of magnitude, the right ballpark uh, for both the U.S. and the Canadian study. Um, they're a little bit less certain in, in the Canadian case, but I, I don't think anybody is going to care about the second significant figure in these benefit cost ratios anyway. The takeaway from, from both of these studies is in general for 99% of the population, it's going to be um, uh, natural hazard mitigation saves, and most of the country is going to remember one figure, uh, six to one or something, and that's not going to be the number that that actually applies to the decision situation that they're looking at. But that's what they're going to remember anyway. So if uh, they're misremembering uh, uh, a five to one number, a six to one in Canada it's the same thing as if they're misremembering the number in the United States. The important thing is that whether in Canada or the United States, the, the public and policymakers and uh, uh, developers all have access to information that says natural hazard mitigation saves uh, under these conditions. Um, here's how you can find all the technical details. Here's where you can find the uh, some summary information. And this is one more point I'd like to uh, uh, elaborate on uh, because for the, the ICLR study, the one we did, uh, Glenn and uh, 
Paul and, and, and um, my business partner, Charlie Scother, and I did for um, the National Research Council of Canada, we produced both a, a big, ugly technical report that has all the fancy math that nobody wants to read and some summary texts, uh, some, some fact sheets um, that, that are much more accessible to uh, the general public. So I hope that in that way, both the studies are, uh, are useful to um, the general population in a way that the 2005 study was not. Great. Um, and then I just have a follow-up to that question. I think it should be our last, unless we get a uh, last-minute one. Um, so it's, how do you find, or how did you find data quality and availability in the two countries, between Canada and the U.S.? Um, it's, um, uh, in some cases, uh, better in one, in some cases, better in the other. Uh, we have uh, better flood map information in the United States and Canada, as I highlighted uh, in one slide with a couple of, um, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, negative quotes about uh, uh, the age and accessibility of Canadian flood maps. Uh, but um, Canada has some information that is uh, uh, better than the United States. Um, I'm struggling to remember an example, but I know that there was uh, there were one or two cases where the Canadian data was better. Uh, in general, um, U.S. data was uh, uh, you know, the U.S. Census Bureau provides a whole lot more accessible information about uh, the economy, uh, about uh, individual uh, construction. There's a lot of um, uh, and and you know the authors of the of the U.S. study, they had their own file information that was much richer uh, for the United States um, than, um, you know, than, than we had for Canada, just because we work uh, mostly in the United States. Uh, mm -hmm. So there was, you know, there, there are some data gaps uh, in Canada. Um, uh, um, things about the models of roads and uh, number of bridges and uh, 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 flood maps and whatnot. Uh, but it's not, you know, the difference was not enormous. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so I think that is it for questions. Is it okay, Keith, if people reach out to you at the email you provided, if there's any follow-up questions? Sure. I'd be happy to uh, yeah. take calls or emails. Okay, great. Perfect. Um, so thank you again, Keith, for the presentation. That was very, very interesting. Um, and I'll just remind everyone uh, to keep your eyes peeled for when we announce our next Friday forum. Uh, and thank you to everyone that attended today's webinar. Thank you. My pleasure to speak. Thank you all. Bye-bye.